This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory. Um, this particular lecture will be um, mostly about congruences and Fermat's theorem. So I'll start by reviewing congruences. So we say A is congruent to B modulo C, um, just to mean A minus B is divisible by C. So this notation was introduced by Gauss and turns out to be really useful. Um, so you should think of two numbers as being congruent, as being sort of the same in some ways if you ignore multiples of C. Um, congruence preserves addition and subtraction and multiplication. So if A1 is congruent to A2 and B1 is congruent to B2, um, here, um, if the number C is fixed, we sometimes miss it out. So, so we sort of think of these all as being mod C, except I'm not actually saying mod C for simplicity. Then this implies A1 um, plus B1 is congruent to A2 plus B2, and A1 times B1 is congruent to A2 times B2, and A1 minus B2. 1 is congruent to a2 minus b2. So, so um, usual arithmetic with addition, multiplication and subtraction is preserved. Um, division isn't necessarily preserved. Um, for instance, we notice that 2 is congruent to 0 modulo 2, but 2 divided by 2 is not congruent to 0 divided by 2 modulo 2. So that's just 1 is not congruent to 0. Um, so um, there's, there's, there's one thing you've got to be careful of that we'll see things quite often that we see quite often A1 um, to the B1 is also not necessarily congruent to A2 to the B2 so um, congruences don't work for exponentiation we'll see, we see a variation that does work for exponentiation a bit later um, so um, a set of residue classes is a set of numbers such that every number is congruent to one of them modulo um, uh, whatever number we were fixing as, as the number we take congruences with respect to. For instance, if we take C equals 5, a set of residue classes might be 0, 1, 2, 3 or 4. That's because if we've got any number it's congruent to exactly one of these numbers modulo 5 because we can write a is congruent to 0, 1, 2, 3 or 4 modulo 5. And this is of course just the remainder if you divide a by 5. And you notice these are all different modulo 5. So what we can do is we can think of these numbers as forming a little set that's closed under addition and multiplication because we just take addition and multiplication modulo 5. So for instance um, addition um, looks like this. So if we add two numbers, um, and here we get 5, which is 1 plus 4, though that's congruent to 0, so we put a 0 there. And similarly, and we get 2, 3, 4, 5, 0, 1, 3, 4, 5, 0, 1, 2, um, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So this is an addition table for numbers modulo 5, and the multiplication table kind of looks similar. Um, so 0 times anything is going to be 0, and 1 times anything is going to be um, that thing, of course. And if you multiply 2 by 4, you get 4. If you multiply 2 by 3, you get 6, which is just 1. And similarly, 2 by 4 is 8, which is the same as 3. Um, and 3 by 3 is 9, which is 4, and 3 by 4 is 12, which is 2, and 4 by 4 is, is 4, which is 1. So here's how you do addition and multiplication modulo, modulo 5. Um, um, if you've done course in algebra, abstract algebra, um, you know that you, you've come across this, and the set of residue classes actually forms something called a ring. So a ring can be defined informally as something with addition, multiplication and subtraction that obeys most of the rules of high school algebra. 
Um, you've got to be a little bit careful. It doesn't actually obey all the rules. For instance, one of the rules of high school algebra is that if a b is is um, sorry, if a b is equal to zero, then a equals zero or b equals zero. And this sometimes breaks down um, for congruences. For instance, we have two times three is congruent to zero mod six, but two is not congruent to zero mod six, and three is not congruent to zero mod six. It does work if the number you're taking congruences with is prime, because if a times b is congruent to zero mod p, where p is prime, that means p divides a times b, which implies p divides a or p divides b, because that's a property we prove for primes, which implies a is congruent to zero mod p or b is congruent to zero mod p. So um, non-zero numbers whose product is zero are called zero divisors. So generally, if you're working with congruences, we can get these rather annoying zero divisors, which uh, cause endless problems. But if we're working modulo a prime, we don't have this problem. And that's why people very much like working modulo a prime rather than modulo anything else. So if we're taking a set of residue classes, modulo a number m say we can obviously take the numbers one two three four up to m minus one is the obvious choice um, there's no real reason why we have to do that if we're taking numbers modulo five for example instead of taking zero one two three four we could take minus two minus one zero one two um, perfectly good choice if we were really interested in powers of two we could take um, one two four Eight as our residue classes, except we also need to add in zero because zero isn't a power of two. If we want to be really perverse, we could take 10, 21, minus 13, 3, and 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4 as our residue classes. I mean, it would be a kind of a stupid thing to, to take this as a set of residue classes, but it would work. So, um, so the usual choice of zero, one, two, three, oops, three, four, and so on is the most convenient one, but there's nothing really special about it. Um, so let's give a few examples. Um, um, there's a well-known test for divisibility by nine. Um, suppose we want to test whether 357 is divisible by nine, or more generally, what's the remainder if you divide three, 357 by nine? Well, a simple way is just to add up the digits. Three plus five plus seven is 15. Then we add up the digits of 15, 1 plus 5 is 6. So 357 is congruent to 6 modulo 9. So why does this work? Well, you know 357 is an abbreviation for 3 times 10 squared plus 5 times 10 plus 7 times 10 to the 0. So um, now we notice that 10 is congruent to 1 modulo 9. So, so this can be written as 3 times 1 squared plus 5 times 1 plus 7 times 1 modulo 9. So we can say these two numbers are actually congruent modulo 9. And this is just 3 plus 5 plus 7, which is 15. And we can do the same thing again. 15 is just short for 3 times 10 to the 1 plus 5 times 10 to the 0, which is congruent to 3 times 3 plus um, so what's that 3 doing there? That's a 1. So 1 plus 5 modulo 9. Um, um, so th this actually used to be used um, when people did lots of hand calculations as a sort of check. For example, if you, if you want to mo check that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times 6, 7, 8, 9... Um, is equal to something rather complicated that I don't really care about. If you did this by hand, there's a pretty good chance you might have made an error. So as a check, you would make sure that these are the same modulo 9. So you add up the digits of this, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, um, which is um, congruent to 6, modulo 9. And you do the same thing for this. So um, um, this modulo 9 is 3 modulo 9, so if you multiply these together, it should be 18, which is 0 modulo 9. So you then check and see that the digits of this sum up to something divisible by 9, and if they're not, you know you've made an error. Um, 
there's a similar check for divisibility by 11. So if I want to know what is the remainder if you take 1, 2, 3, 4 um, and divide it by 11, so I want to know what is this congruent to modulo 11, um, what you do instead of taking the sum of the digits, you take an alternating sum. So I'm going to take 4 minus 3 plus 2 minus 1, which is congruent to 2 modulo 11. So this gives a a fairly quick check to see whether a number is divisible by 11. You just um, add up the digits with alternating signs. And this works for much the same reason as before. We can write this as equal to 1 times 10 cubed plus um, 2 times 10 squared plus 3 times 10 plus 4 times 1. And now we notice that 10 is congruent to minus 1 modulo 11. So this is 1 congruent to 1 times minus 1 cubed plus 2 times minus 1 squared plus 3 times minus 1 plus 4 times 1, which is minus 1 plus 2 minus 3 plus 4. So we just get the alternating sum of digits. So, so this gives a quick test for divisibility by 9 and 11. It also gives a test for divisibility by 3 because 3 divides 9. Uh, tests for divisibility by 2 and 5 are trivial because you know you just look at the last digit, um, which leaves 7 as the only small prime there's no real good test for. So um, if, you, if you're used to doing numerical calculation in your head, you know that dividing by 7 is, is, is the tiresome prime to deal with. Um, so um, let's have another example. Is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 a square? Square of an integer. Um, and there's a very quick way of dealing with this. We just notice that um, the last digit is 7, and the last digit of a square can never be 7. And let's try and think why this is. Well, we have a is congruent to b mod 10, where b is equal to the last digit. So a squared must be congruent to b squared. And what can b squared be? Well, b must be equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9. So b squared must be 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, or 81. So the last digit must be 0, 1, 4, 9, 6, 5. So these are the only possible last digits of square numbers, which you can see by doing them modulo 10. In particular, um, this number isn't the square of an integer. You can just see it instantly. Actually, doing squares modulo 10 sort of works, but you can do much better by, by looking at squares modulo 8. So we can ask, what is a squared modulo 8? Well, we just look at... Um, a, which must be congruent to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7, and look at a squared modulo 8, and we get 0, 1, 4, 1, 0, 1, 4, 1. So we find a squared must always be congruent to 0, 1, or 4 modulo 8. So um, let's have an application of these. Um, we, can, we can ask, can we write... integers as sum of three squares. And obviously you can't write all integers like this. You can easily check that 7 is not equal to a squared plus b squared plus c squared for any c. There are only a few cases to check. But in fact, we can show there are infinitely many cases when you can't do this. So if a is congruent to 7 modulo 8, then we can say a is not equal to b squared plus c squared plus d squared. And we can see this as follows because each of these numbers here is 0, 1 or 4 modulo 8. So the sum of all three of them must be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 or 6 modulo 8 because these are the only numbers modulo 8 you can get by adding up three of these. In particular, 7 never appears. So no number that is 7 modulo 8 is a sum of three squares. For example, if we take 1 million and 7, 
this can't be written as a squared plus b squared plus c squared. You can see that immediately without checking hundreds of thousands of possibilities for a, b and c. Um, if you ask about four squares, then in fact there's a famous theorem of Lagrange that says that every number is in fact a sum of four squares. So if you're looking at squares, then doing congruences modulo 8 is a really good thing to do. Um, we can also do something for cubes. So let's try and ask which... Can we write orbit a finite number of numbers as sum of three cubes? Well, cubes don't work modulo 8 so well, but they work really nicely modulo 9. So let's look at what a squared is modulo 9. Um, sorry, a cubed is modulo 9. Um, well, we, we notice immediately that a plus 3 cubed is equal to a um, cubed plus 3a squared times 3 plus 3a times 3 squared plus um, 3 cubed. Um, here we're using the binomial theorem, and we notice that this is divisible by 9. So if you add 3 to a number, you don't change what it is modulo 9. So to work out what a cubed is modulo 9, we only need to look at three numbers, minus 1, 0, or 1, because any number can be obtained from one of these by adding a multiple of 3 to it. And these are obviously just common to minus 1, 0, or 1, modulo 9. So a cubed plus b cubed plus c cubed must be congruent to minus 1, 0, or 1, plus minus 1, 0, or 1, plus minus 1, 0, or 1, modulo 9. And these numbers can be minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, or 3, modulo 9. So any number that's the sum of three cubes must be um, a sum of must be one of these numbers modulo 9. So if n is congruent to 4 or 5 modulo 9, n is not the sum of three cubes. Um, question of which numbers are sums of four or more cubes modulo 9 turns out to be rather difficult and complicated. Um, so now we'll come to the I don't know, perhaps the single most useful theorem about congruences, which is due to Fermat. And this says if p is prime, then a to the p is congruent to a modulo p. For example, we know immediately that 2 to the 11 minus 2 is divisible by 11 without actually calculating 2 to the power of 11. Um, this fails if m p is not prime. So in, if, if we look, for example, if we look at 2 to the 6 modulo 6, um, 2 to the 6 is 64, which is, a, is, is just 4 modulo 6, and, uh, and uh, which isn't equal to isn't congruent to 2 modulo 6. So, so um, this doesn't work for most numbers. So uh, uh, as another example, um, um, we might want to show that if we take the number 1 fifth of n to the 5 plus a third of n cubed plus 7 fifteenths n, this sure doesn't look like an integer, but this is always an integer. And um, there's an easy way to do this. Let's multiply it by 15. So we have 3n to the 5 plus 5n cubed plus 7n. And we want to show this divisible by 3 and by 5, because if we can show it's divisible by 3 and 5, that shows it's divisible by 15. Well, now let's check divisibility by 3, where we know n cubed is congruent to n mod 3, so this becomes 3n to the 5 plus 5n plus 7n, which is congruent to 3n to the 5 plus 12n, which is obviously divisible by 3. 
And we can do the same thing for 5. We have 3n to the 5 plus 5n cubed plus 7n is now congruent to 3n plus 5n cubed plus 7n. And here we've used the fact that n to the 5 is congruent to n. And this is congruent to 10n plus 5n cubed. And this is obviously congruent to 0. And this is all done modulo 5. So Fermat's theorem easily shows that this funny looking expression is also always an integer. So how do we prove Fermat's theorem? Well, um, here we're going to use uh, something we proved about binomial coefficients. So we recall that if we've got the binomial coefficient p choose k, this is divisible by p if 1 is less than or equal to k is less than or equal to p minus 1. For example, if we take p equals 5 and we work out x plus y to the 5, we find this is equal to x to the 5 plus 5x to the 4y plus 10x cubed y squared plus 10x squared y cubed plus 5xy to the 4 plus y to the 5. And we notice that all this stuff in the middle is divisible by 5. So we find x plus y to the 5 is congruent to x to the 5 plus y to the 5 modulo 5. And exactly the same thing works for any prime p because um, um, if we expand out we find all the binomial coefficients divisible by p except the ones at the beginning and the end. So we find x plus y to the p is congruent to x to the p plus y to the p modulo p. Um, so, um, you know, if, if, if you're trying to deal with high school students or something, you think that x plus y cubed is equal to x cubed plus y cubed. They're usually wrong, but they're right if you're working modulo 3. So, so um, this, this formula sometimes makes arithmetic much easier. Well, now we can prove Fermat's um, theorem by induction. So we want to show that n to the p is congruent to n modulo p. And let's just check this. Let's try n equals 0. Well, 0 to the p is obviously congruent to 0 mod p. So that works. What about n equals 1? Well, again, it's trivial. 1 to the p is obviously congruent to 1 modulo p. What about n equals 2? 2 to the p. Well, that's equal to 1 plus 1 to the p, which is congruent to 1 to the p plus 1 to the p, which is congruent to 2 modulo p. So that's OK. What about n equals 3? Well, 3 to the p is congruent to 2 plus 1 to the p, which is congruent to 2 to the p plus 1 to the p by what we've just shown. The a plus b to the p is a to the p plus b to the p, which is congruent to 2 plus 1 mod p, because we just showed 2 to the p is congruent to 1 which is congruent to 3 mod p. And now we can just go on like this. Um, more precisely, we prove it by induction. So we assume n to the p is congruent to n modulo p. And then we deduce n plus 1 to the p is congruent to n to the p plus 1 to the p by what we just said, x plus y to the p is x to the p plus y to the p. And then this is congruent to n to the um, so n plus 1, because we just assumed n to the p is n modulo p, which is um, what we're trying to prove. This is, this is n plus 1 modulo p. So if we've, we've, it's correct for 0, and if it's true for number n, it's true for n plus 1, so it's true for all positive integers. And if you like, you can prove it for negative integers either by working backwards by induction or noticing that any negative integer is congruent to a positive integer modulo p. Um, so that's the first proof of Fermat's last, Fermat's, it's not his last theorem, Fermat's theorem. Um, we'll be having another proof um, a few lectures time, um, which is actually a, maybe a slightly neater proof. So here's another application of Fermat's theorem. Problem is the number 35 prime. Well, this looks like a kind of stupid question. You can immediately see it's divisible by 5 and therefore not prime. But what I want you to do is pretend 
this has say a thousand digits and I'm going to give you a computer and a thousand digit number and I want you to tell me whether it's prime or not um, and um, so what, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to run a test of, for this number that will sometimes work for very much bigger numbers well if it's 30 if 35 is prime then we can ask is 2 to the 35 congruent 2 modulo 35 if not then 35 is not prime if it is does that imply 35 is prime well we'll discuss that when we've done this example so what i'm going to do is i'm going to calculate 2 to the 35 modulo 35 so let's first try a stupid calculation what i can do is i can write 2 times 2 equals 4 2 times 4 equals 8 2 times 8 equals 16 2 times 16 equals 32 2 times 32 equals 64 2 times 64 equals 128 and I can just keep going like this until I get to 2 to the 35 well that's obviously not going to work if 35 was a really big number because this would first of all this would take more than the age of the universe to do and secondly these numbers would get so ridiculously large that they wouldn't actually fit into the universe so that's no good let's try again Well, here I'm going to go up to 2 times 16 equals 32, and then I'm going to say 2 times 32 equals 64. But now um, I can reduce this modulo 35, so I can say this is, this is congruent to 29 modulo 35. And then instead of taking 2 times 64, I can take 2 times 29, um, which is equal to 58 modulo 35 which is congruent to um, 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 uh, 23 and then I take 2 times 23 is going to be 46 which is going to be congruent to something else and I can go on like this so we reduce mod 35 each step and this solves one of the problems because now the numbers I get here are not going to grow ridiculously big. They're just going to stay less than 35 or less than this thousand digit number. And a thousand digit number, is, uh, computers can cope with that just fine. So, but that's still no good because it's still going to take 35 of these steps. And if 35 was really large, that would just take too long. So here's another idea. So, so, so here's a second, the second speed up. Um, suppose I want to work out 2 to the 35. Um, instead of multiplying 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 and so on, which is a kind of stupid way, there's a much slicker way as follows. I write 35 is equal to 2 to the 5 plus 2 to the 1 plus 2 to the 0. OK, so I'm, I'm really writing out 35 in binary. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to work out powers of 2. So I'm going to have 2 to the 1 equals 2. Um, 2 to the 2 equals 2 squared equals 4. 2 to the 4 is equal to 4 squared, which is equal to 16. 2 to the 8 is equal to 16 squared. Um, 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 which is congruent to 11 mod 35. And then 2 to the 16 is now going to be um, congruent to 11 squared, which is congruent to 16 mod 35. You see I'm reducing mod 35 um, to, to keep it smaller. And then 2 to the 32 is going to be congruent to 16 squared, which turns out to be congruent to 11 mod 35. So I work out 2 to the um, power of a power of 2 by repeated squaring and now I can work out 2 to the 35 by picking out these th three here so I can take 2 to the um, yeah, I've got 2 to the zero is um, 1 so I take the 1 and the 2 and the 32 and I find 2 to the 35 is congruent to 2 to the 32 
times 2 squared times 2 to the 1. Now I just multiply these out mod 35. And this turns out to be congruent to 18 mod 35. So 35 is not prime. Um, and if you think about this, you'll see that this, this algorithm is actually pretty fast, even for a number with, with say, a thousand digits. So, so for example, if, if the number has about a thousand digits, then we're going to need to um, square to a few thousand times. Well, that's not too bad on a computer. And each time we're going to be doing calculations with integers that have a, you know, a few hundred or a few thousand digits. So, you know, the total number of steps is going to be maybe a thousand times a thousand and maybe you want to throw in another factor of a thousand because you're multiplying thousand digit numbers or something so we it's going to you know if you're working with thousand digit numbers it will take maybe a thousand cube or a thousand for four steps or something which is is perfectly reasonable on on current computers so this is a really fast um way of checking whether a number is prime um well it doesn't always work so we said that if 2 to the p is not congruent to 2 mod p, this implies p is not prime. What if 2 to the p is congruent to 2 modulo p? Does this imply that p is prime? And the answer is not always. Here's an example. Let's take the number... 561. This is a so-called Carmichael number, named after some um, Carmichael who um, discovered this phenomenon. Now, um, um, 561 has the following funny property. 561 is equal to 3 times 11 times 17. So that this isn't the funny property. The funny property is that 561 is congruent to 1 mod 3 um, minus 1 and is congruent to 1 modulo 11 minus 1 and it's congruent to 1 modulo 17 minus 1 as you can easily check this just means it's divisible by 2 and 10 and 16 and what this means is that um, 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 if we've got any number a, a to the 5, 6, 1, um, well, this is going to be a to the 2 times something plus 1 because it's congruent to 2, 5, 6, 1 is congruent to 1 modulo 2. So it's going to be congruent, and this is going to be congruent to a mod 3 because a squared is congruent to 1 and similarly this is equal to a to the 10 times something or other plus 1 which is going to be congruent to a mod um, 11 because a to the 10 is congruent to 1 modulo 11 and finally it's equal to a to the 16 times something plus 1 which is going to be congruent to a modulo 17, again because a to the 16 is congruent to 1 modulo 17. So um, we find that um, a to the power of 5, 6, 1 is congruent to a modulo 3, 11 and 17. And so a to the 5, 6, 1 is congruent to a modulo 3 times 11 times 17, which is just 561. So Fermat's theorem actually works for this funny number 561, even though 561 isn't prime. Um, so this is an example of something called a probabilistic prime number test. So, so you run this test on the number and, you know, you, if you've got a big number n, you might calculate 2 to the n and ask, is it congruent to 2? modulo n. And if this fails, then the number's definitely not prime. If it passes it, you might try 3 to the n is congruent to 3 modulo n. And if it fails that, then the number's definitely not prime. If it passes and it passes a few more, you might suspect that it's prime, but you can never be certain because it might be one of these funny Carmichael numbers. And it's actually now known there are an infinite number of these. 
Um, fortunately, there are better probabilistic prime number tests that are less likely to, to fail. So, so we do actually have some um, other tests that we will discuss later. Um, um, now I want to um, complete something that we discussed in an earlier lecture but didn't really finish, which I wanted to show that there are infinitely many primes of the form 4n plus 1 with n greater than or equal to 0. So, um, in other words, if, if you write the number to base 4, then its last digit is going to be 1. Um, and I sort of gave about half of a proof, but there was um, one step that I didn't carry out. We want to show the following thing. If p divides n squared plus 1, then p equals 2 or p is congruent to 1 mod 4. So the only numbers that divide square plus 1 are prime to the form 1 mod 4. Let, let's look at the first few cases. Let's take n equals um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And if we look at n squared plus 1, th this is 2, 5, 10, 17, 26, 37, 50, and 65. And if we look at the prime factors, we get 2, 5, 2, 5, 17, 2, 13, 37, 2, 5, and here we get 5 and 13. And we notice that all these numbers here are 1 modulo 4, and we, we never get numbers like 3 or 7 or 11. Um, so we can show this using um, Fermat's theorem. So um, let's take p to be odd, and um, let's suppose n squared plus 1 is congruent to 0 mod p. Uh, sorry, when I said these are 1 mod 4, they're 1 mod 4 or 2. 2, of course, is not 1 modulo 4. Um, um, well, um, suppose n, uh, n squared plus 1 is congruent to 0. Well, this says n squared is congruent to minus 1. These are all modulo p. Um, um, on the other hand, we know from Fermat's theorem that um, um, 1 is congruent to n to the p minus 1 modulo p. Here we're just dividing n is congruent to n to the p mod p and dividing by n. Um, and this is congruent to uh, minus 1 to the p minus 1 over 2 modulo p because n squared is congruent to minus 1. So we must have 1 is congruent to minus 1 to the p minus 1 over 2. And this is um, minus 1 if p minus 1 over 2 is odd, and 1 if p minus 1 over 2 is even. So it can't be minus 1. So p minus 1 over 2 is even. So p is congruent to 1 modulo 4. By the way, um, there's one thing I've said here. I, I said we could know that n to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p um, by dividing by n. And you remember you've got to be a bit careful dividing by n. So, so we know n to the p is congruent to n modulo p. And if we divide by n, this says that n to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p if n is not congruent to 0 mod p and p is prime. So you remember that if p was a prime, then we can't have two non-zero things modulo p multiplying by zero, which means we can actually divide by, by numbers, provide they're not divisible by p. So, so we can actually use this congruence. Anyway, so we've shown that if p divides n squared plus 1, this implies p equals 2, or p is congruent to 1 modulo 4. And I just recall how we use this to find an infinite number of primes of the form 4n plus 1. Suppose we've got some primes p1 up to pk that are all 1 modulo 4. If we want to find a new prime modulo 4, we take 2 times p1 times p2 times pk, and then we square it, and then we add 1. And we take a prime factor, Well, this prime factor must have the following properties. 
there must be two or one modulo four because it divides a square plus one. Second, it's not equal to two or P1 up to PK, because if it was equal to two or P1 up to PK, it would divide this bit, it would divide the whole lot, so it would have to divide one. Um, so it's a new prime of the form one modulo four. So we get an infinite number of primes of the form one modulo four. Um, if you actually try this, it's actually not a terribly efficient way of producing primes of the form 1 mod 4 because these numbers get very big very rapidly. Um, um, OK, uh, so that's the first part of this lecture. In the second part in the next video, I'll be discussing some more applications of Fermat's theorem to testing numbers for being prime and factorising them.